All right. And I am on the clock. Perfect. Great. All right. So that being said, let's go ahead and switch on back here and let's get started. So a good afternoon to everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Welcome to today's webinar, Trauma and Stress, Cognitive Signs and Symptoms. My name is William Moore, and I am with OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. Center. <coughs> Excuse me. And as your technical host, I would like to take a few minutes to discuss a few features of the Adobe Connect webinar platform and provide a few announcements to keep in mind. Please note that today's webinar is brought to you by our friends at the Innocent Justice Foundation. To access their information and get more information about Innocent Justice Foundation, you may uh, click on the links located on this slide. This is also funded by the USDOJ, the OJJDP, and of course ICAC Training and Technical Assistance. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on Intact's YouTube channel at a later date. You can access the channel where you can view past uh, shift webinars, and you can also contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk if you would like to get um, additional supporting materials. For those wishing to download a copy of important documents and resources related to today's webinar, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly above the chat area. Here you will find the webinar PowerPoint and a an frequently asked question document for webinar participants that will likely address any technical related questions. Simply click on the name of the file and then click the download button. At the end of today's webinar, there will be a question and answer session where the presenter will address some of the questions posed during the presentation. Please be sure to type your questions into the chat box as they arise. Now, if you're viewing in a group, please help us count. Go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you're viewing by yourself or alone, there's no need to type anything at this time. But for those who are viewing in a group, meaning more than one individuals, please type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. Following today's webinar, please note that you will receive a certificate of attendance. Attendees signed in will receive an automated feedback email with a certificate of attendance. Please note that attendees that are joining as part of a group should download in conjunction with the signed in attendee group validation form in the handouts pod. This will allow for those individuals that are in a group with you to receive their certificate. If you're signed in, you do not have to complete the form, only for those in the group with you who wish to receive a certificate of attendance. Now, that being said, I would like to turn over today's presentation to Beth Medina. Beth, take it away. And Beth, you may be on mute. Thank you, William. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So nice to have you here with us today. Um, I just wanted to welcome you and uh, let you know that we at Innocent Justice uh, have been working with uh, ICAC uh, teams across the country for more than a decade. Um, we are the training and technical assistance provider for officer wellness, so we've been doing mental health and, and wellness training and, and topical information for quite some time with ICAC. And so we wanted to bring to you some of the information that we provide in our, um, in our one day training program. And obviously due to COVID, we are not out and about training, but um, we wanted to bring it here online and hope that you will um, get a lot of information from this. So we've done two previous uh, webinars, and I encourage you to take a look at that through um, either NTAC's um, site, or you can go to our website where they're also listed at um, shiftwellness.org. We are going to have three other uh, 
webinars, all based on um, tra secondary traumatic stress and um, vicarious trauma and secondary trauma. The next three will be emotional uh, responses to it uh, and mitigation tools, uh, behavioral, and then worldview responses um, to trauma and mitigation. So we, I encourage you to come back and join us for the other webinars. Uh, and please reach out to us, ask questions today if you would like. Uh, we are happy to try to answer as many questions as possible before we bring everything to a close today. So thanks so much for being here, and um, look forward to your questions. I'll turn it over to Jean now. Or Alan, I'm sorry, I'm not sure which one, Jean or Alan, our trainers. Is it introduction time? It sure yes, it is. is. All right. Uh, Jean, I think you were going second because you're going to carry the next slide, so that means it's my turn. So welcome to everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for being here. Now, I'll say this. I do understand how calendars work and that it's technically Thursday, but I think we all know that for the government employees, at least, this is basically a Friday afternoon. I recognize and applaud you for being here. Uh, my name is Alan Flora. I am currently employed as the special agent in charge of the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation Computer Crimes Unit, and I work uh, specifically as the commander of the Internet Crimes Against Children, or ICAC Task Force, in North Carolina. Uh, I have uh, close to three decades of law enforcement experience. I started in 1991, and I've been specifically dealing with um, child sexual abuse cases and uh, ICAC work since 2007 as a full-time job. Uh, but I would also stress that the things that we're talking about are not specific to ICAC. Basically, if you have a stressful job where you deal with sensitive issues, what we're saying applies. So uh, thank you for having us today, and I'll turn it over to Jean. Thanks, Alan. I'm Jean McAllister. I am a social worker and I represent the mental health component of our team today. Uh, I have well over three decades worth of experience in this field. I've worked in child protection. I worked as a psychotherapist in a specialized trauma treatment program. I administered Colorado's Sex Offender Management Board, where we set standards for assessment, evaluation, treatment, and behavioral monitoring of convicted sex offenders in Colorado. And I um, was the executive director of our Coalition Against Sexual Assault. So I have um, extensive experience. I currently run my own business, and I do um, training consulting and a substantial amount of expert testimony in cases that have trauma involved, many of them child sex abuse cases or child sexual exploitation cases. So that's where my interest and experience in this field come, and I'm really happy to have all of you here today. Um, if you think of questions while we're presenting, please feel free to type them into the chat. We will have um, Beth and William monitoring those, and we have a time at the end of the presentation where we'll be able to answer questions for you. So um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. The first thing that we're going to do is do a brief overview of what we hope to cover today in our objectives. Um, we're going to do a very brief introduction to secondary trauma and traumatic stress. So for those of you who haven't come to any of the other webinars, you will have enough basic information to understand how that reaction informs our cognitive signs and symptoms of trauma. We'll review how the body responds to trauma and stress, and we will focus today specifically on cognitive or intellectual signs uh, and symptoms of traumatic stress and secondary trauma. So how trauma interferes with our thinking, our judgment, our ability to plan, all of those sorts of skills that we need to do our jobs. And then we will also discuss resilience, the ability to bounce back from negative experiences, and we'll provide tools and techniques that can help you cope both in the moment and um, as you're working through your day when you're not necessarily being traumatized. So hopefully you'll be able to have 
um, a, a pretty good overview of how you can take care of yourself in this particular arena as we start today. So the first thing I'm going to focus on is what secondary trauma is. It's essentially the experience of being exposed to traumatic material, often repetitively and over time, which any of you who work in ICAC are, um, and having responses based on that exposure. The DSM series, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that we use in mental health that tells us what impacts people identifies secondary or vicarious exposure, hearing about someone else's trauma, seeing pictures of it, knowing that it's happened, seeing the aftermath, can impact us the same way that primary trauma does. So we need to understand basic trauma responses. The first um, of those is our essentially protective survival responses. Um, because trauma is experienced as something that overwhelms how we typically cope, because we typically perceive it as a threat to either ourselves or someone else, in many cases the children we're trying to protect through ICAC, um, we engage in what we identify as survival responses. And our um, brain function changes from using primarily our prefrontal cortex and our cognitive skills to the much more primitive part of our brain, the midbrain, where we are using our survival-based skills and we're not necessarily choosing them intentionally. In our culture, we tend to talk about those as fight or flight. Um, the reality is there are three primary survival responses in humans, fight, flight, and freeze. And that makes sense. If we can successfully fight the person who's harming someone and win, then hurting the child stops. If we can successfully get the child away from the person, flight, or we can get ourselves away from the harm, then the hurting stops and we can survive. How freezing works, we believe, is related to how we were initially primary prey animals to large predators before we had weapons with relatively good aim. So for many, many thousands of years, we were prey animals. And large prey, or large predators tend to see movement, not detail. So we believe that's where that freezing response developed. It's also very accurate that many people, and many of you have probably seen this in the children you've worked with, freeze or have some inability to respond when there is a, um, a predator harming them, a human predator. The thing I'd like you to remember about this today is that we know that people who engage in successful fight or flight responses tend to have more positive outcomes and less long-term negative trauma responses. And we sometimes, when we're sitting still looking at material, when we're sitting at our computer building a case, when we're doing um, engaging with predators, trying to find where they are or to find the kids that they are targeting, we tend to experience that as freezing. So some of our coping skills may focus on doing that differently. We, I want to remind you all as we talk today that we, oh, I'm sorry, Alan, this is yours. I'm still saying oh, this over to you. <laughs> that's okay. I, I think uh, we're still all getting used to doing things remotely and uh, so we're, we're accustomed to doing these things in person, so it's a little bit odd when you can't look to your uh, co-presenter. So uh, the signs and symptoms, something that's very important to consider is that vicarious trauma has, uh, can affect you in many different ways. You may notice signs in more than, you know, just one or two areas but it also affects different people different ways. So the part that it affects you might not be the same as your coworker who experiences the exact same uh, traumatic experience or, or scene. Let's say you both go to the same scene, but you may have different reactions. So we're gonna to talk today in particular about cognitive and intellectual, but just understand that you know, the effects 
uh, are basically in, in five domains, physical, cognitive, intellectual, emotional and relational, behavioral, and your worldview or spiritual. So today's focus is on cognitive and intellectual. Uh, but understand that uh, if you don't particularly connect with one set of symptoms, it doesn't mean you aren't experiencing something in a different realm. And Jean, if you'll explain a little bit more about that. I will. One of the questions we often get in this um, arena is, it makes sense to people that they may periodically feel bad or have some symptoms like waking up worrying about a case that's really um, traumatic or um, come home feeling like they need to unwind a bit. And people ask, what's the difference between what's sort of a normal response to the really difficult work we do and what's the more dangerous or troublesome response to the work that we do? And the way we sort this is on kind of um, two different um, trajectories. And we look at the degree um, of intrusiveness or persistence. So the first trajectory is how persistent is this trouble indicator? How often is it happening? For instance, if you wake up worrying about a case that you're working on right before you're set to go do a warrant or um, before trial when you're going to have to testify and there's a really nasty defense attorney who you know is going to cross-examine you and be difficult, that's pretty normal and that's not going to um, disrupt your life very much other than just the worry right before these things happen. However, if you start having that sort of waking up at night, worrying about it, forgetting about your own kids' activities because you're so worried about this other case, or it makes you not be able to sleep for multiple days in a row or worse, multiple weeks, or having disrupted sleep every night for a period of time, that becomes more intrusive into your daily life, and it can impact your functioning in your workplace, with your family, with your own parenting, and it can, if it lasts, become incredibly disruptive. So we really want you to think about those two things. How often is this happening, and how intrusive is it being into my daily life? Um, and those are ways to Support the difference between something that's relatively normal because the material we work with is so difficult and something that really may you may need to take a real notice of and address and in some cases ask for help if you're getting to the trouble indicator area. So Alan, so, would you like to talk a little bit about compounding factors for people? Sure. Uh, you know, compounding factors are things that uh, basically add to what's already going on. You know, it's bad enough that you have to deal with this horrible situation, but on top of that, you have things such as insufficient resources. I'm sure many of us have dealt with that in terms of we don't have enough people to cover things, or we don't have the proper equipment, or we feel like we're lacking in the resources. We see the critical nature of what we're doing. We understand the urgency of it. But when we ask for what we need, we're told, sorry, you know, we, we just don't have enough to cover that right now. You'll have to make do. That's a real world situation that I think, um, you know, it, it happens and we have to understand that that is a compounding factor that only adds to the, uh, the stress that you're feeling. You know, cases that don't get investigated, the reality of it is we have more things coming in than we have the resources to handle sometimes. Uh, so you have to triage things triaging cases, looking for the things that look like they're the most critical, that ultimately means you're missing some of the victims. They're the ones that you'd like to look more into, but you have to make choices today. Uh, that can weigh on you because you have the fear of missing someone, fear of missing a victim. Uh, and then the you know inevitable pressure from management to do more with less. Uh, there's also, uh, I know for me, a stressor is the reluctance to say no to requests. So, we have inadequate resources to handle it all. You know, we have literally, uh, in terms of like Nick Mix cyber tips, we're receiving thousands per year, but we only have a dozen people to handle this. Uh, you don't want to say no to anything, but 
you still don't have the resources. So that's that's a you know those two things they don't really fit. How do you say no? Uh, well, sometimes you just have to. That weighs on you because you're afraid you missed something. Um, you know, uh, overwhelming the professionals who are dealing with this also comes from external sources. Uh, lack of understanding from the general public. You know, that's something that can be challenging because there's always the, um, you know, the Monday morning quarterbacks who want to look at a situation that you handled and say, well, why didn't you do this? But of course, they don't have your training, your experience, and they didn't have the view that you had. Um, you have a possibility or you have your responsibility to protect the community, you know, from somebody reoffending. So that weighs on you. Um, and then their daily contact with victims or offenders can be stressful to you. So all of these things, they keep compounding and adding up. Uh, and then, of course, you increase caseload and just the severity of the things that we're seeing. All of these tend to aggravate the negative effects of what you're dealing with. Jean? Thanks, Alan. When we are talking about traumatic stress, we're literally talking about intense react reactivity. And when we're dealing with difficult or frightening things, when you're on a search warrant in someone's home, when you are rescuing a child, that level of reactivity is really protective and helpful to you. However, operating at that level of reactivity all day long for multiple days in a row can be really difficult. So figuring out how you're impacted and what kinds of things are causing you problems and learning tools and skills to address those things so that you can kind of reduce your reactivity can be incredibly protective for people. And that's something we really want you to focus on today is think about which of these things have happened to me or the people I'm responsible for supervising or my colleagues and what are some tools that might address those particular issues. So when we're talking about um, a lot of the intellectual or cognitive impacts of how secondary traumatic stress impacts us, um, one of the things that I think about is something that when I was working as the um, Title IX coordinator at the University of Denver several years ago, I supervised a group of investigators that responded to any of the sexual violence complaints that we had on campus. And we had a young man who was really funny. He had a new baby, and he prided himself on telling stupid dad jokes and making people laugh and leaving funny little drawings places. And he figured out pretty quickly that for me, when I'm overly stressed, my sense of humor stops working. And I don't get the most basic, silly dad jokes. And so he would sometimes walk into my office and go, OK, do we need to go walk and get a cup of coffee? Do we need to talk for a minute? Because you've lost your sense of humor again, and that's not good. And it was really incredibly helpful to me to have someone that perceptive around me who could sort of just raise his hand and say, hey, I'm seeing the signs. Because it's very often true that people around us see us being impacted before we see it ourselves. Alan, do you have something that you would want to um, share about how you've been impacted cognitively? I think with me, it tends to be the hyper focus. Uh, when I'm under intense stress, whether it be dealing with you know, a lot of work issues, and, and sometimes, you know, that, that work issues could be the 50 emails that flooded my inbox one morning. I tend to get focused on it, and I lose track of time, and I lose track of other things that are going on. And I'm not aware of it while it's happening, of course, but I might be really intensely working on something, and then, you know, literally four hours, five hours later, and, and forgive me for the example I use, but it's real, uh, you know, four or five hours into this, Suddenly I realized that, hey, wait, I'm really hungry, I'm really thirsty, and I haven't been to the bathroom and needed to go for the last three hours. So wait, that's what that, that sensation was that I was feeling. And, and, and again, I apologize for that, but it's a real thing because that hyper-focus 
kind of just, it's almost like the stress takes care of or, or, or takes control of me and I'm fighting whatever that particular battle is, overlooked all the other things that my body is telling me I need to take a break and, and go do something else. That's a great example, Alan, and one that I bet is not uncommon for people that are on the webinar today. So we have a question. We would like you to answer this question for us. What is a cognitive sign of traumatic stress that you've seen in yourself or others? And we should be able to see everyone's responses coming up here. Well, lack of focus is coming up dramatically. Someone wrote, my analytical skills become less functional. And that's great because it takes into account some of those things about not being able to, to concentrate, your memory being impacted, your energy going towards hypervigilance. And some of these clearly cross over to emotional or um, to physical because someone wrote anxiety and difficulty concentrating. Anxiety can definitely impact your capacity to concentrate. Um, and sleeplessness or physical pain or some of those things that impact our physical well-being can impact our cognitive functioning as well. So it's nice to see you recognize that. And I just I love this one. Oh. Go ahead, Jean. Go ahead, Alan. Well, no, I just uh, the hypervigilance, and and I will say that's something, and that that also kind of gets into the worldview, which is a, a different uh, presentation. But you know, when you see so much, and you see so many threats, uh, or you see so many cases of abuse, then you know there's almost like your radar is always on for that, and you're always looking for it. Uh, and if you're not careful, you see it even when it isn't there you know, the slightest um, look or, or, you know, what you perceive is, is something negative that you see a family in a restaurant or someone in the store and you feel like that person's a threat to my child or that person is a threat, you know, of doing this. Um, that that mm -hmm. tends to, to get hold of us sometimes. It does indeed. And, and it can impact how we interact with people. People are talking about that. That, again, goes more to the emotional, but there's definitely that crossover among all of these things. Um, I think feeling like you're on autopilot, um, having short attention, being distractible, forgetful, all of those things are related to our cognitive skill. And you all did a really nice job of covering these, which is really, really nice. I appreciate that. So I think we'll move on. I think it's nice for you all to see each other's answers as well. I think that makes a difference for people. Um, it allows them to see that they're not the only ones who are experiencing those things. And it looks to me like you covered many of the things we were planning on talking about. And if you think about the fact Remember earlier when I said it's a different part of your brain that is functioning when you're experiencing trauma. So where we use our skills like decision making, sorting information, prioritizing, remembering things, um, being articulate, being able to concentrate effectively without being just driven, all of those things are skills that typically happen in the prefrontal cortex. Trauma disrupts those. And so things like um, losing words or sitting in front of a, a stack of cases that you normally would be able to review and assess relatively quickly and feeling like you don't even know where to start or being unable to concentrate or easily distractible are often happening because a different part of your brain is kind of primarily running things. And that's important to understand. That was a that was a great set of answers you gave. Alan, is there anything you want to add to that? 
Now, I, I would say this. I'm, I'm really interested in seeing the variety of people that are attending today. I've noticed from some of the comments that we have people represented in law enforcement and mental health providers, and I think I saw maybe a victim witness advocate. And I think it's fantastic that, um, you know, we're all connecting in this way because, you know, as I said before, these things aren't specific to law enforcement. They're not specific to ICAC task force work. These are things that just happen when somebody is dealing with stressful situations. So it's important that we, you know, we don't put ourselves in boxes and say, well, that can't happen to me because I don't do a certain job. These things can happen to all of us. That's a great point. I love that. So the next question we have for you is, is there something that you do now or that you practice to help alleviate those cognitive kind of thinking or intellectual disruptions you get from secondary traumatic stress? Excellent. Lots of people are talking about breath. We're going to talk about that in a second. Exercise, breaks, being mindful. I love how many of you are saying breathing and breaks. Stop and, and talk and talk to a colleague is really helpful as well. It lets you refocus. And exercise, walking movement uses up those stress chemicals, so that's another great thing. Having an emotional response and allowing yourself to have it can allow you to move through it, something like crying. Sounds like there's some real strengths here in terms of coping with these kinds of responses. Prayer is another thing that works very much like what we understand meditation works like um, in terms of kind of quieting the system and allowing people to reset. So really great coverage of this one. I noticed the word cry, and, and I would just want to, you know, that makes me think about the, the saying, I'm going to have a good cry and just get this out. You know, crying is not necessarily yes. a negative thing. Sometimes crying is a huge stress reliever, and it allows you to just, you know, it's a natural way the body releases things and can actually make you feel much better. Absolutely. And I like that someone noted art because that pulls you out of the intellectual stuck place and into a more expressive place. I think we're probably about ready to move on here. So thank you all for taking the time to answer that. And again, I just want to reinforce that we really had um, some great tools for this. I'm having trouble getting the slides to advance. So, Alan, if you can do that, that would be helpful. There right, we there go. go. Pick it up with 2020. I think you did. Um, so when we have those responses, some of the things that you mentioned are, as a group, are really powerful. The ability to um, take a moment and breathe or to have a good cry or to talk with someone you care about or a colleague and just sort of debrief for a minute, those all really help. There are also some really simple things you can do pretty quickly. Um, one of the things in terms of taking a break, if you don't think you can really get up and go away from your computer, we have something called 202020, which is literally looking away from your screen at least 20 feet away from it for at least 20 seconds 
will break up anything that's sort of a stuck response in the way your brain function is working. The other thing that um, I think is really important is so much of trauma response is made up of sensory information, pictures in our head, sight, sound, smells, um, emotional responses like pain or anger. So anything that you can do that triggers a strong sensory response can help you break up a trauma response. For instance, having access to a lemon or an orange at work or a tangerine that you can cut in half and smell because they have a very strong scent. Drinking a glass of water or a cup of tea, having something that literally you're tasting or, or um, using to have a different sensory experience can break that up. And even something like yawning, which triggers us breathing more deeply and can break up that sort of shallow, fast breathing, breathing that often goes with the trauma response. The other thing you can do is take a moment to, um, actually, Alan, I want you to talk about how you talk about triggering both sides of your brain, because you do a great job of that. Well, I appreciate that, Jean. So, uh, I'm 50 years old, so I say that just to, to make the point that it's been a little while since I was in elementary school, especially since I started. But every now and then, um, I'm reminded of that poster that they had, or, or the, I think it might even be a book, but everything you need to know or everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Uh, and I'm reminded of just keeping things simple, the fundamentals, like, you know, be nice to each other, um, you know, don't say mean things. Uh, but one of the others uh, that always comes to mind is, uh, surprisingly, the hokey pokey. Now, some of you are probably wondering where I'm going with this, but if you think about the hokey pokey that we did in kindergarten, or many of us did, you know, you put your right hand in, you put your right hand out, you put your right hand in, and you shake it all about. Well, as crazy as it sounds, that's an excellent way to relieve stress. So, for instance, if you shake your right hand and then shake your left hand, uh, it actually can kind of reset your brain, and Gene can explain the mechanics of that from a, you know, a professional <laughs> mental health provider standpoint. But all I can tell you is it works, and if it takes, you know, calling it the hokey pokey maneuver to remember it, then by all means do, but shake your right hand and shake your left. That's great. Gene, and, and explain why adding the hokey <laughs> Adding that hokey pokey language makes me laugh, which triggers another coping skill, which is really, really positive. Now, a couple of more things that you can do is think about using something you're good at, acquired knowledge, a skill you have um, when you're feeling overwhelmed. Like if you are um, really good at some part of setting up a case or writing material for a warrant, and you want to take the break from what you're doing that's triggering you and do that thing you're really good at, or if a colleague asks for help with something, take a break and use your acquired knowledge that gets you back in the prefrontal cortex, it gets you out of your trauma response, it also helps you feel more in control because you feel capable when you're using skills that you know how to use, and that's important. And then we have in our own bodies a chemical that combats cortisol, which is a stress chemical, some of which is dumped into our bodies when we have a trauma response, and some of which ends up sort of hanging around after we have a trauma response that can cause us long-term negative impacts like weight gain and um, higher blood pressure and um, even difficulties with um, coronary artery disease over time or diabetes. So we really want to get you get rid of that. All of you who talked about exercise or moving or, or those sorts of things, that's one way to get rid of it. The other way is to access our protective chemical, which is oxy oxytocin. It's identified as the attachment chemical for human beings. It is, if you take just a moment and Think about, for those of you who have children, for those of you who are in love with someone, for those of you who have a pet you adore who makes you feel good, if you 
think about that person or that child or that pet, often you can feel a good feeling quickly. It's almost like your brain is remembering the good feelings that come up when you're with that person. That is literally dumping oxytocin into your system. Um, there are jokes about it in the mental health community. It's identified as the reason women have second children because they forget about the pain and they remember more about the wonderful thing of attachment with an infant. Um, so it's something to think about. You don't need the person that you care about to be present. You just need to focus on them or think about them for a moment. And that will bring up that positive feeling that has some of the oxytocin attached to it. And that is the one chemical that literally uses up cortisol, that negative stress chemical. It's very important that you don't pair the use of oxytocin while you're looking at your screen with images of child sexual abuse. You don't want to be thinking about your own child where that's with your screen. You want to turn away from any traumatic material and think about that person because that's more protective. So um, think about who you might want to put in your, that's a positive way to get some oxytocin in my system. So another way to reset the brain is literally combining some of the things that you all talked about. Um, and the way we frame them is tension, posture, and breath. That means if you're having tension or stress in your body, your shoulders get tight or you're clenching your jaw, move into it. Clench it a little harder and then release because your primitive brain recognizes voluntary action. When you think about posture, we're often tight when we're in that sort of um, trauma response mode. And if you think about it, you may be engaging some of the muscles you would engage if you were about to fight or run, often kind of pulled into ourselves, tense. So if you can think about sitting up straight or standing up straight, kind of squaring yourself, getting some balance, and loosening up a little bit, that's protective. And the research is pretty clear that five full deep breaths in a row can break up a trauma response while it's happening if you're doing them intentionally. So those of you who identified breathing as a part of your protective skills, great skills to have. Um, and then the, the other thing that you can do that's really powerful is doing some kind of movement that's related to what animals do when they're traumatized. And often what they do when they get up after being traumatized is shake. They literally shake it off. Now, you don't want to do that in front of a victim or in front of an offender or in front of the press. But if you're in your office and you can close your door and just shake it off, it's a very powerful way to reset um, and, and re-engage your brain function in a much more positive way. We already talked about some of these. Alan, do you want to talk a little bit about the positive benefits if we do this? Yeah, we'll touch on this, and then we'll move into a question session. But um, as far as your resiliency skills and benefits of doing this, uh, positive thinking. You know, this is going to help you to feel better and think more positively. And then in turn, thinking more positively is going to help you handle your stress better. Your decision-making skills will improve. If you, if you learn to manage the stress um, and deal with it while it's happening, you're going to make more effective and, and ideally better decisions. Adaptability and awareness. Uh, I'm going to use this moment to quickly give a very shameless plug for our website, shiftwellness.org. Shiftwellness.org. I encourage everyone to go there, and particularly the cause of what's on this slide, uh, if you click on the upper part of that and see our newsletter section. Our last two newsletters have to do with uh, positive thinking and also uh, adaptability through brain elasticity. So I'll tease you with that. Uh, and then uh, we will move into our question session. Oh, I'm sorry, poll question. Yeah.
<laughs> Hokey pokey went over well, Alan. I was going to type it myself, but thank you to whoever did it to, did it for me. Thanks. <laughs> I think that might be our strongest one. Yawning and shaking it off in 2020 seem to be things that people picked up that they hadn't thought about doing before, which is great. Because some of these I things you can it. do right in the moment. Exactly. The hokey pokey, yawning, whatever it might be. Think about it as something as simple as changing the channel on the television. You can be focused on something, and it can be stressful or whatever, but if you can do something to change the channel, that's essentially what you're doing in your brain. Whatever action it is, smelling the orange, whatever it might be, change the channel, move away from that stressful channel for a little while, and then you'll be able to focus better. Excellent. I think we're just about ready to move into our session where we can answer some questions. Yes, actually, we um, thank you so much, guys. It was terrific, all that information. Um, I, I just wanted to maybe talk also about adding something like essential oils and how maybe we can talk about how that might work. How would you use essential oils or some of the things around um, uh, mint and, and whatnot? How might that help? Well, Essential oils have that component, a sensory component, because it's something you smell. Some of them, like lavender, are tend to be calming and relaxing, so that may relax you and pull you out of that sort of hyper-focus that Alan was talking about. Um, other oils, like those related to citrus or stronger scents, um, can sometimes sort of just grab your attention and refocus your brain on that sensory information instead of something negative you've been focusing on, much like smelling an orange or a lemon would do. So they can be used either for calming or for the strong sensory component. Um, and both of those work to help reset your brain. And, and let me add to that. It uh, kind of goes back to the changing the channel. Uh, in a more, I guess, simplistic language that I speak in. But um, I, I want to throw this out there again. I mentioned earlier I'm 50 years old. I've been in law enforcement for nearly three decades. Um, it's fair to say that there was a point where I was maybe a little set in my ways. Uh, essential oils, when you mention it, you know, my reaction to that three or four years ago would have been to laugh at it. Um, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but that would have been my reaction then. Uh, over the last few years, I've tried to stretch my brain a little bit and to learn some things instead of just thinking what I already thought. Uh, and I have learned without question that, you know, someone mentioned earlier in the comments, a mint, you know, <laughs> smelling something that is different or doing something to reset your brain and change that channel absolutely can, can help you clear that stress and move into a different way. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Yeah, we like to keep a lot of things um, right in the office that are very helpful. So we usually have a bowl of peppermint. Um, sometimes as long as people, someone brought up here that you have to be cognizant of any allergies, and, and I appreciate Sarah pointed out that we do need to kind of take that into consideration. But in, in our office, you know, we often talk among ourselves about things, fragrant or smells, essential oils that we would like. So we have we run essential oils, and then just the getting up and moving, I think, is another thing that um, people really, um, really connected with in, in their sharing. Um, we have a couple other questions here. We have um, someone was wondering about fawning. Um, I know that recently there has been some um, there has been some research done about fawning as another part of the fight, flight, freeze then you have the fawning. So, Jean, can you talk a little bit about that um, to the best of your knowledge? I can. It is, um, I would say, more than based in the trauma literature. It's based in the um, primarily child sex abuse literature. And it is the idea that sometimes people um, become compliant with someone who's abusing them, particularly when that person 
person has some sort of power over them, as often a parent or a position in, a person in a position of trust does. So they may um, not resist or fight and not become completely immobile, but sort of appear to comply with whatever um, someone who's traumatizing them wants. Um, but it's more often seen when someone is actively traumatizing someone and when that person has actual power over the person. So it's less likely that you would see that response in a professional who's being exposed to secondary trauma. Not impossible, but much less likely unless they have some trauma history of their own that might be being triggered. Does that make sense for people? I think so. Um, we have another question here about um, how important is the physical office environment to alleviating um, stress? How can it uh, be helpful in alleviating stress environmentally? Alan, do you want to take a, um, a, an effort at that, well, or I mean, would you I, like me to take it? I, I think we can both take a, a shot at that, but I, I do think your physical environment can certainly affect how you react to things. You know, I know that people work in particular with child sex abuse images traditionally get stuck in a dark room, in a closet, it seems like, or, or in an you know, enclosed environment with no windows because that's a security issue and you don't want other people to see things. But at the same time, being closed up like that can, you know, um, make you feel shut off from the world. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so important to, you know, occasionally get up, walk outside, get some sunlight. Uh, in other words, you know, just you know, go back to that term, changing your channel. So that might be a way that physical environment uh, can make a difference. And then also, just Gene, you can address this, but, you know, the things that you surround yourself with in that way. Absolutely. We just got a comment from one of the participants about having a comfortable chair, a window, nice paint. Um, you know, some of our ICAT commands have done things like put things that are reminders of why they're doing the work. Um, one of the ICAT commands has tiles of children's handprints all around the office. That in you, Anywhere you go, you just look up and you see that. Having inspirational statements or things that are kind of funny that make you laugh, those things can be very helpful. And as long as they're not paired with your screen where you may be looking at different, difficult material, somewhere in your space having pictures of people you care about and trust so that you can trigger that oxytocin response and you turn around and look at them, or of your pets, or of a great fishing trip you went on with your buddies, or of you know your book group that you drink wine with every Sunday night, whatever the whatever the reminder of the positive is, having those available can also be incredibly helpful. And let me add something to that. And Gina, someone, I think the, well, the current environment that we have, where there's a lot of working from home, and that's something that, particularly in in this you know subject matter, a lot of things would never be done from home. You would have a strict definitely you know, uh, defining lines between what's at work, what's at home, your workspace, and your home safe space. And because of COVID and, you know, the move to do a lot of telework, I know many people are forced to combine things that would otherwise never be combined in the same space. So uh, even that within is. your home environment, uh, I know, a, a, well, actually a suggestion I heard Beth Medina give to someone in a, a different uh, session once online was uh, she recommended that if you have to have your workspace at home then perhaps you do something to alter that space during your work period like for instance take a sheet or a blanket and throw it over that chair so that it has a different look and even a different you know sensory touch feel um, a way to separate work time and home time that's really helpful. And another thing that people can do is make sure that they do something to do successful leaving of the trauma. So if you are working a case or you have your computer open, even if you live alone, close those programs, close the computer, put any case materials that you might be dealing with back in their folders in your computer. 
so that if you open it to answer an email from a family member, the first thing you see is not more work. That you and if and if you're one of those people who worries about whether you will remember, make yourself a list and look at that the next morning when you start again, because it's really important to separate work and home life, and it, it's much more important that you take clear steps to do that when you're working in your home. Also, having the same place you work every time, not dragging your computer around to six different places in your house, but having a place where you do this work and then having it not bleed into the rest of your living space. And I would throw in, Jeez, don't um, check work emails from home. Where, if you can help it, have a place to read the work emails besides in bed or, you know, in a relaxation spot. Jean, really quickly, um, can you talk a little bit about what fawning looks like, uh, the how the characteristics may look for fawning? We've gotten some question about that. Okay. Yes. Um, you are often going to see, like if you see an, a, um, a child responding to sex assault, um, from a family member or a, a person in a position of trust. They may comply with what the offender or the person wants without protesting, without crying, without looking overtly distressed. What they're doing is literally trying to comply so they don't get hurt, but it can look like voluntary response. You may see this, I saw that someone mentioned domestic violence as well. Um, you may see this with someone who has um, experienced domestic violence, with someone who has intimate partner sex assault, even an adolescent who's experienced that. Well, if people are not actively um, talking about that, in some of the research on child victims, you're going to see it associated with um, people who have trauma bonds with their offenders, who are literally attached to and trying to please their offenders. Um, and it's often used by defense attorneys in cases that I um, testify in to say, oh, well, that person wasn't upset. They were voluntarily participating. They were consenting. Um, and it's really important that we recognize that coping behaviors that people have when they're being traumatized by someone more powerful are not the same as the capacity to consent and the ability to consent and then actual consent. Um, so I think okay. those are some of I would look for. Is that helpful? Do you think that That's responded great. maybe? That's okay. great. Thank you so much, Jean. And um, I just want to encourage people, if you have other questions, if you need things like a, re a resource um, link, just email us and we'll do our very best to get that information to you. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm going to turn things back over to William. Uh, really appreciate everyone being here. And uh, you know, just reach out if we can be of any support. Thanks so much. Yes, great. And thank you to uh, thank you, Beth, for being our moderator for today. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Jean, for uh, such a great presentation. Before we end, I do have just a few final announcements for everyone. Please note that if you'd like to uh, get in contact with OJJDP's Intact, you can do so by accessing the information on this slide. If you would like to get in contact with OJJDP, you may do so by uh, contacting us um, at the information on this slide, including the email address, ojjdpta at usdoj.gov. Do you have a training or technical assistance need? Well, if so, please uh, utilize the OJJDP's TTA 360 system, where you can uh, sign in and submit your TTA 360 request there. Please note that the webinars, uh, this webinar and other uh, SHIT webinars are recorded and will be hosted on our YouTube page. The link is uh, here on this slide. Please take a moment to review this disclaimer. 
And finally, please be sure to join us for these upcoming events. We have another SHIFT webinar coming up J uh, July 9th next week. Uh, the registration is live and the Learn More link is live as well. We also have a webinar with our colleagues in DAA coming up uh, next week as well. You can feel free to learn more or register there. And also we have uh, additional, again, SHIFT webinars for the month of July. Uh, that are available for everyone to register or even uh, select the Learn More link to learn more about each of them. We also have a webinar with our colleagues at APA coming up as well. And also, uh, with, um, again, more shift webinars and then our colleagues at Zero Abuse also have webinars coming up that are available for folks to uh, click on to register and to learn more. Finally, for those of you who are remaining, uh, please take a few minutes to uh, do one last poll that we have here. Uh, we want to know, how do you plan to apply the information from this webinar in your work? Note that there are several, um, oh, excuse me, hold on one second. Sorry about that, I need to change this to multiple answer. There we go, okay. So here we are, you can select multiple answers here. So go in here and just let us know, how do you plan on applying the information from this webinar in your work. Notice there are, there are multiple answers here and you can select multiple answers as well. That is all for me. Again, thank you all very much for attending today's webinar. Have a wonderful and safe 4th of July weekend. Take care and we will see you again soon on the next webinar. Thank you, bye-bye. The host has left the meeting, so at this time, the meeting will come to an end.